Let's continue now our discussion of Chapter 4. In this section, we're going to talk about enantiomers. We're going to look at specific rotation of polarized light. We're going to talk about racemic mixtures. We're going to talk about mixtures that have excess of one enantiomer over the other enantiomer. And we're going to talk about how to experimentally resolve one enantiomer from the other enantiomer. For the most part, enantiomers have identical physical properties. These include boiling point, melting point density, and refractive index. Let's look at 2-bromobutane, and let's compare the R enantiomer to the S enantiomer. If I look at the boiling point, the R enantiomer has a boiling point of 91.2 degrees Celsius, and the S enantiomer has a boiling point of 91.2 also. Melting points, minus 112, minus 112. Refractive index 1.46, 1.46. Density 1.253, density 1.253. Okay, so enantiomers have identical physical properties for the most part. There are a few exceptions, and those exceptions are very important. It allows us to identify which enantiomer we have, but it also plays a big part in biochemistry. So let's look at the exceptions. So enantiomers rotate the plane of polarized light the same magnitude but in opposite directions. For example, R2-bromobutane might rotate it clockwise or counterclockwise, but S2-bromobutane would rotate it in the completely opposite direction. So this theory and specifics are outside of this course, but if you look, go take a physics course here at the University of Alaska Anchorage, you be, they'll show you why that's true. The second big exception is the enantiomers interact differently with other chiral molecules. So enzymes are typically chiral and they are selective for either the S or the R enantiomer. Examples would be taste buds. We could have one enantiomer taste like cloves, the other taste like spearmint. So our scent receptors and our taste bud receptors are also chiral. So chiral molecules react with chiral molecules. Let's first look at polarized light, and here's a schematic. I take an average light bulb. If I look at the polarization of light coming out of that light bulb, it's typically polarized in every single increment of 360 degrees. If I put a polarizing filter in between the path of that light, I can actually filter out and have just one axis of polarized light flow th go through that filter. And if I have a second polarizer that's parallel to that, all that light that's coming that gets polarized gets to see my eye. Now, if I take that same light polarized in 360 degree increments, I send it through a first polarizer, I polarize it, if I instead now put the polarizer at 90 degrees to that, a second polarizer, zero light gets through that polarizer. And you can see that effect when you take polarized sunglasses. If I put polarized sunglasses that are polarized and rotate one by 90 degrees, very little light gets through. We can use this principle as sort of a detection system, as analyzed. So we can analyze what the light coming through that polarizer is just by rotating this second polarizer. This is just a schematic representation of an apparatus that could measure how stereochemical molecules, enantiomers, will rotate plain polarized light and measure how many degrees it rotates them. I have a light source, which is a sodium lamp. It produces a bunch of different bands of different intensity. I place in the path of that light a monochromator, which filters out all but one line. We call that the D line. My light is still polarized. I put a polarizer in there to selectively polarize and emit just one of those polarizations. And then I have a sample cell, which I put in my organic molecule, either my R enantiomer or my S enantiomer. As that light passes through that material, it starts to rotate that plane of polarization. And so it's no longer vertical. It might be here at 
15 degrees or 30 degrees or 45 and I rotate this second polarizer till I get a maximum signal and then I measure the angle at which I detect that light. This sample can either rotate it clockwise or counterclockwise. If I rotate it clockwise we call that the dextrorotary enantiomer and I indicate that by putting a plus or a D in front of my systematic name for the molecule. So D means clockwise and plus means clockwise. If it rotates plane polarized light counterclockwise, it's going to be noted in my name as either the L stereoisomer or the minus stereoisomer. Notice that both of these, the plus and minuses or the Ds and Ls, have nothing to do with R and S. R and S are just nomenclature systems. Okay. So here's my plane polarized light. It's got 0 to 360 degree polarization. Here I've sent it through a monochromator, so I get one wavelength. I get one wavelength and one polarization. My sample rotates it either clockwise or counterclockwise, and it rotates it depending on what the molecule is at a certain number of degrees, depending on how concentrated my sample is and how long my path length here is of my sample. And then I use my second polarizer and rotate it to measure a maximum intensity of light that comes out, my measured rotation. So we put a compound in our system and we measure how many degrees it rotates the plane of polarization. I could actually then measure that and standardize it by standardizing it at 25 degrees and using the sodium D line at 489 nanometers. But I also need to correct for my concentration and my pass, le pass length. So I take my observed rotation just for my instrument then I correct that for concentration and path length and we call that our specific rotation so I have observed rotation and I have specific rotation again depending on the concentration of the sample in grams per milliliter and the pass length in decimeters that's an unusual unit here and it's it's we do that so we get the units of my specific rotation and some workable units. Let's look at an example. Here I have cholesterol. I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven chiral carbons in this molecule. If I place some of that cholesterol and I take one gram of it and I put it in a 10 milliliter solution and I have a 200 millimeter long polarimeter, I measure uh, observed optical rotation of 6.3 degrees. I need to standardize that correcting for path length and concentration. So I plug in my numbers here. I have an observed rotation of 6.3 degrees. I have one gram per 10 milliliters and I have two decimeters. Notice I changed my units here to decimeters. And so my specific rotation is 3.15 degrees. And I should be able to get that number anywhere in the world, no matter which polarimeter I use, as long as I take my observed, divided my con by my concentration and my path length. I have a second molecule that I have here, and it is a hypothetical molecule because it doesn't exist in nature. Cholesterol is made by living organisms, and it only makes this enantiomer. But if I had another molecule, if I had this enantiomer, well, all these seven different stereochemistries were inverted. I'd have the enantiomer. What would be the specific rotation of this enantiomer? It would be opposite and equal. That's the definition of an enantiomer. So if this first enantiomer, the naturally occurring one, rotates plane polarized light 3.15 degrees in the plus direction, its enantiomer will rotate it counterclockwise at 3.15 degrees too. Most biological systems are comprised of chiral compounds. These include proteins, enzymes, carbohydrates, DNA, receptors, and hormones. So if I were to ingest or eat a chiral compound, 
it would be acted on differently depending on which enantiomer I'd have. So, biological systems can actually distinguish between enantiomers. By comparison, chemists have spent decades trying to recreate this selectivity in the lab and have had marginal luck. Biology can differentiate very easily between an R and an S enantiomer, where in some lab practices we cannot distinguish between the two. An example of how life recognizes enantiomers is if I take the R enantiomer of epinephrine. Notice here I put an R out there, but I've also put a negative here. That tells me that this enantiomer rotates plane polarized light counterclockwise. If I look at the enantiomer of it, the S enantiomer, it would then have to rotate plane polarized light in equal amount, but in the opposite direction, so clockwise. So R and S are nomenclature, plus and minus indicate how they rotate plane polarized light. If I look at an enzyme, it has a very definitive shape to it. And so if I want the enzyme to do some sort of reaction on this molecule, my molecule has to fit right down into this three-dimensional shape. And so this enzyme will only act with the R enantiomer. If I had the D enantiomer and I ate it, it does not fit in there quite right, and it doesn't do anything. It doesn't do any chemistry to it. So that is one example how biological enzymes are only active for one of the two enantiomers. We can also look at taste receptors. If I look at these two molecules, I notice they are mirror images of each other. And if I looked at the optical activity, one rotates plane polarized light clockwise, the other rotates plane polarized light counterclockwise, they have the same connectivity. One of them tastes like caraway, and it has a very distinctive flavor. This molecule is actually the active taste of spearmint. So while enantiomers have mostly the same properties, they interact very differently with chiral molecules. In other words, our taste receptors are chiral. What if I have a mixture of both enantiomers? I have 50% are the R enantiomer and 50% are the S enantiomer. We call that a racemic mixture. And there are a lot of examples in lab chemistry where we have racemic mixtures, one to one ratios. In other words, I have a DL pair or I have a plus minus pair. And we actually notate that sometimes when we're doing the naming. So let's say I have one mole of S 2-butanol that rotates plane polarized light in the positive direction, and I have one mole of the R enantiomer, which rotates plane polarized light in the counterclockwise direction, and I mix those two moles together. I now have a racemic mixture. I have an optical rotation of zero, so if I have equal amounts of both of those, I rotate plane polarized light in no direction. I therefore know I have a racemic mixture, and I'm going to sort of show that by putting this squiggly line here. I either don't know which enantiomer I have, or I have equal amounts of both of them. And this is optically inactive. How could I actually separate out these two molecules from each other? Let's say I have a racemic mixture of products. If I do a hydrogenation reaction, so I have a double bond here, if I add hydrogen from the top, I get this molecule, I get the R enantiomer. If I react hydrogen from the bottom, I get the S enantiomer. So I literally can create racemic mixtures depending on how the chemical reaction occurs. So if I were to go and measure the rotation of plane polarized light, I would have a zero plane zero rotation of plane polarized light. If one of these is favored over the other, then I would rotate either the light in the clockwise direction or the counterclockwise. Remember that R and S have nothing to do with how I rotate plane polarized light. I have to go measure it. I can't just say S is clockwise or counterclockwise or R is clockwise or counterclockwise. I need to measure the direction that it rotates plane polarized light. 
Let's now see if we could calculate how much of one enantiomer we have or an, another enantiomer if I don't have an equal amounts of the two in solution. We call this my optical purity. That's the observed rotation over the rotation of one of the two pure enantiomers times 100%. We often call this also the enantiomeric excess. The enantiomeric excess is just the percent of one enantiomer minus the percent of the other enantiomer. And I can look at those percentage. I look at how much D I have over the total. That's a percentage now. I look at how much L I have over the total. Subtract those two times 100%. I can reduce that to D minus L over D plus L times 100%. If we want to look at an example, what is the enantiomeric excess in the observed rotation of a mixture containing 5.0 grams of the plus enantiomer, it rotates light positively, and 5.5 grams of the minus enantiomer, which rotates plain polarized light in the counterclockwise direction. Noting that if I did measure the specific rotation of the pure enantiomer, I'd get plus 13.5 for the plus, and I'd get minus 13.5 for the minus enantiomer. Let's put in some numbers here. So I have 5 minus 5.5. Those are my concentrations of the two enantiomers divided by 10.5, which is the total. That means I have an enantiomeric excess of minus 4.76. I can put that back into my equation. I'm going to manipulate this one a little bit so my observed rotation is actually equal to my specific rotation of one of the enantiomers divided by its enantiomeric excess. And so I get minus 0 0.643. And that would be my observed rotation of this mixture right there. Okay. Let's look at some chirality of conformations. If I look at this molecule right here, this 1,2-dibromo cyclohexane, notice that I have a equatorial bromine and I have an axial bromine. If I do a ring flip, I actually form the mirror image and they're non-superimposable, so these should be chiral molecules. However, the inner conversion of these at room temperature is so fast, it's sort of the average of the two. If I want to look at chirality, I can see that one of my conformations, I have a Gauche interaction to the left. And if I go through a ring flip, I have a Gauche interaction to the right. However, right at that transition state, I actually have a mirror plane that goes through those. So a molecule cannot be optically active if it is in an equil equilibrium with an achiral molecule, and it's in equilibrium with this transition state between one of the conformations and the second conformation. And also, if I drew this as a planar structure, notice I have a mirror plane right down through the center here, which also tells me this molecule is achiral. There are, however, other ways besides having a chiral carbon that a molecule could be optically active. The one we've talked about at length here is an asymmetric carbon, where I have one enantiomer and I have another enantiomer, a tetrahedral structure with four different groups, a chiral carbon. I could also have heteroatoms instead of a carbon. I could have a sulfur or I could have a phosphorus or nitrogen and just have four different things attached to it. I could also have a molecule that's rigid, that can't twist about single bonds, because these oxygens will bump into these ones. So I could have two molecules here, one which with this hydroxyl group sticking out, this whole group is sticking out of the board, and the other one where it's twisted. So I could have chiral molecules and not even have a chiral carbon. An example of that would be this conformationally locked system. If I look at this molecule right here, I do not have a chiral carbon. But my bromines here, if I tried to twist about that molecule right here, they'd bump into each other. So this molecule and this molecule over on the right-hand side 
are non-superimposable mirror images, but they can't interconvert. So this would be a conformationally locked chiral molecule. And these are challenging to see. Enantiomers of each other. Another example would be an alkene that's conformationally locked. For example, if I look at this molecule right here, I can draw a mirror plane through it if it's in the cis conformation, the cis stereoisomer. If I have the trans stereoisomer and I looked at it end on here, notice that these two cannot interconvert because I can't twist about that single bond. These are mirror images of each other. So they're non-superimposable mirror images. It's a little bit difficult to try to move that in space. But if you had a model of this, you would be able to recognize that those cannot be superimposed. These are non-superimposable mirror images of each other. There's another type of molecule where I have alenes. And if I looked at an alene, I have two double bonds right next to each other. In order to have an alene, I have to have my pi bonds at 90 degrees to each other, which means I can't rotate either of these bonds. And that means I could have different conformations, different stereoisomers. In this case, I have my hydrogens in the plane of the board. And in this case, I have my hydrogens sticking one out of the board and one into the board. So an example of that would be 2,3-pentadiene here where I have the two double bonds right next to each other on the same central. So let's look at the two examples here. I could either have them with my CH3 back into the board or my CH3 on the opposite side. These are mirror images of each other. They're non-superposable mirror images. And therefore, these are in.